Great. So, um, hi there. Uh, you know, like David said, um, I'm Tanner, and um, you know, uh, I guess as as we're going, if you have any uh, questions, go ahead and um, uh, punch them in there, and uh, we'll we'll make sure we get to them at the end. Um, all right. So the the focus of this talk is um, is going to be around understanding the design patterns of of messaging, and kind of specifically, we're going to focus on on how to apply this understanding to uh, to working in the healthcare space. So we're going to talk pretty abstractly about how applications communicate with one another, and um, you know, following that, we're going to take a bit of a historical look at how data is exchanged and in the in the healthcare industry in particular, and then what sort of constraints that kind of puts on us as, as developers. Um, in particular here, we're going to we're going to look at how HL7 v2 um, kind of impacts how we have to, to operate um, as, as consumers of, of healthcare data. And uh, we'll see how how we fit that example in particular into into the patterns that we identify. And um, and so being being downstream of, of this data, we're going to we're going to talk about how how can we as developers architect our applications um, for high throughput computing? So an obvious uh, first question to ask here would be, um, what, do I, what do I actually mean by messaging? So we live in a, in a world where there is more than one computer in existence. Uh, actually, on my desk right now, I can, I can actually count that there are four of them. Uh, and honestly, I, I wouldn't even be surprised if, if there are even more than that out there. Um, and, and to make matters worse, uh, all these computers out there are, are running multiple programs. So in order for all these, all these little parts, the, all these programs to, to be able to do anything truly interesting, um, they have to be able to communicate with each other. And, uh, that communication is that's messaging, um, and for for developers out there, you'll you're going to recognize some obvious examples here. So we've got REST or, or SOAP or, or any any number of things, email, even SMS, uh, lots of stuff. Basically, if one piece of software is communicating with another discrete piece of software, um, you know we're talking about messaging. Um, there's, I've kind of, um, kind of got a, a bit of a, a, kind of a mental shortcut to, to think about this. You know, if you've ever drawn up one of those like boxes and lines diagrams of your architecture to, to, to show what you're, you're building as a software developer to someone else, uh, what we're talking about today is, uh, is the lines. So the, the communication between pieces. So messaging is obviously important because uh, I suspect none of you out there are, are working on software that is, that's truly on an island. Um, you know, there's, you, th there's very little software out there that's not communicating with, with any other software out there in the world. You know, maybe you know, we're talking about healthcare data here, right? So maybe your application is getting data from health systems. That's messaging, um, and let's assume you also have, have users, and that they might be interacting with your application via like a web dashboard or a, a mobile app. Um, well, your application and and the thing that's running on their phone are the, that's messaging. So the concept we're talking about here. Is uh, is pretty ubiquitous. Um, pieces of software need to be able to communicate. Um, but the I guess the the problem that kind of comes up there is that uh, if it were if, if if that were an easy task if that if that was a, a an easy problem uh, there wouldn't be a billion ways to to do it. There's countless ways for for software to communicate with each other. Um, so 
So the next best thing that we can do is to is to kind of look at look at all these means of, of software communicating and uh, kind of lump them into into these broader, more abstract categories. And uh, these these categories are that's that's where the notion of, of design patterns comes into play. So we're gonna encounter this idea uh, a lot throughout the rest of the the rest of the talk. Um, but but basically, application architecture and your and the design patterns that you use for messaging um, basically go hand in hand. So much so that that in most cases, um, one often directly impacts the design decisions of the other. And so, with this in mind, I actually want to approach um, teasing out the design patterns that, that we want to talk about in messaging by actually thinking in terms of application architecture first. Um, so at the most fundamental level, I'd, I'd say uh, application can be, can be said to be made up of, of two major components. And that would be events and views. And obviously, there, there's code that kind of wires these things up and connects connects the dots. But um, kind of the, the the core important features that, that we want to talk about here are, are events and views. Um, so so let's get uh, let's get started with defining what I'm what I'm talking about when I when I talk about an event. So. In the computing section, uh, Wikipedia will tell you that an event is an action or an occurrence recognized by software. Um, and that definition is um, is broad, almost to the point of being meaningless. You know, there's it might it might as well say like an, an action is is there an, an event is a is a thing. Um, so. I think we want to dive into this concept by looking at examples, and then that 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 might kind of clarify what this definition is is talking about. So, if you're familiar with front end web development, you're probably incredibly familiar with events, because the browser the browser has them, and they're literally called events. So there there's no hiding. Um, they, uh, th these are the sort of things that come directly from your users. Um, things like clicks or, or button presses or, or scrolling things. These are, these are events that users trigger by interacting with, with the UI that you've, that you've built and that, that is on screen for them. Um, but they, they also don't just have to come directly from from interactions that your users are having with with a UI. Um, you know, oftentimes the the software that that we want that we're trying to create is meant to to model actual things in the real world. Um, and forgive me if this is kind of too on the nose, but. Um, you can imagine that the software that manages a hospital might consider a patient being admitted or a, a surgery being scheduled to be events that occur in their system. Um, and if we want to think about this in, in terms that aren't uh, maybe highly overloaded, um, let's let's think of a completely detached example here. Maybe maybe imagine the software that manages the score at a football game. So in that system, things like uh, like the start of the first quarter, or the home team scoring a touchdown, um, those would be events in such a system. So in the software that that models these these two scenarios that we're talking about, the the hospital and the and the the football game, um, these are these are all actions that we may want our our software to recognize. Or, or do something in response to. Um, so they can they can come from from users on, on screen, um, like the 
the web dashboard example, or they can they can come from external systems, uh, internal systems. Uh, an event can can actually create another event. They're just they they can come from just about anywhere. So so this is what I'm talking about with the the first half of the equation um, with with events. Um, so let's let's talk about the the second half. Uh, which I said was was views, and how it's act, it, it's possible to kind of build a mental model of of almost all of our software in terms of these concepts. So, what is a view? Um, actually, a lot of definitions out there for for what a view is, and um, you know if you go searching for it. You're going to find a lot of um, a lot of technologies use the concept of a view um, to to mean something like hyper specific and and so if you're reading about it, you might get a definition that's that's very honed into to a very specific technology. Um, so things like Postgres or React, um, I believe Rails. Has has some notion of, of of a view, but they they all they all define them very specifically to their domain. Um, but I think there's kind of a, a common kernel we can distill out of out of those definitions to kind of serve as our as our general definition for for what we're talking about with a view. And that is, a view is simply a digest of events that we use to represent the current state of our application. Um, and again, you know, maybe that definition leaves a little bit, a, a little left unsaid or is a little vague. Um, well, we can we can dig through, we can dig into what that means with with uh, some examples here. So, if you're familiar with React and Redux, um, which are which is a common set of technologies to use in the front end. Um, in front-end JavaScript for uh, for web UIs, uh, this this concept should be uh, pretty clear. Um, in that paradigm, the the Redux actions can represent events in our system, and then the, the store itself is a is a single digested view of those actions. So, according to our to our definition, the Redux store is a is a view because the events Having been consumed and digested through the through the reducers, um, they they produce a single data structure um, that that uh, that is a, a view, and that and then that data structure, that the state tree, um, it's often called, uh, that is mapped with by a render function that is a uh, Further turned into the UI, which is itself also a view. Um, so there's there's kind of two views that um, that are kind of important to think about in in this pattern. Um, if you're not familiar with those technologies, uh, we have to. We, we, there's there's some other way we need to to think about this. You know, how do we? How else can we think about? A view in a way that shows that it's a, a roll-up of events over time. Um, well, let's go back to the the example I mentioned when uh, where we were talking about events, the uh, the the football score software. So, if things like the the start of a quarter or the home team scoring a touchdown were the events in our system, the view in this situation would be the scoreboard itself. So notice that any one of these events, like the start of the first quarter or touchdown or whatever, none of those tell you in isolation what you need to know if you want to actually understand the current state of the game. Um, you need something that has consumed all of the events as they have come through, and, and they digest it into a static representation, the, the scoreboard. And and that kind of gives you so 
So imagine you, you missed the first half of a football game. You don't have to, you, you don't have to, you don't have to like go back and rewatch it if you don't want to. You can just look at the scoreboard and it, it, it'll get you right up to speed and what's, what's going on. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to consider a view um, in, this, in this talk. Um, so what all can be a view? Um, a UI, like we talked about with, with React, or um, even, the, even the, the, the scoreboard example could be considered a UI. Um, but we also said that the, the Redux store itself is a sort of view, right? Because it consumes these events over time, and uh, creates some some static data structure to look at. So, data structures can be uh, views, and and that, and then that also extends to databases, which are which are basically just persistent uh, data structures. Um, and in a way, you can even think of, of the, the read model of, of like a REST API as, as a sort of a, a view over, over some, some data model. There's obviously some like transformations that go on there, but um, you can think of it as a view in, in a lot of ways. All right. So if our goal is to talk about messaging patterns, then why have I spent so much time talking about application architecture? Um, like I said before, the, the ways that applications are, are built and, and the ways that external systems can interact with them, those two things are, are inextricably linked. So in the same way that I said that applications can be split into these two major components, it's also true that um, messaging, the, the, the patterns that, that are emergent in, in messaging also kind of fall also also follow this split and it it actually kind of happens in a, they, they happen in alignment with one another so so let's think about what what does messaging in kind of a event-based paradigm look like uh, this this would be a, a pattern that is, is known as the publish subscribe pattern, or um, pub sub for short. Uh, the publisher is the, the source of the information, and the subscriber is the, the recipient here. And uh, this relationship between these two systems is usually uh, established at the behest of the receiving party. And the reason for that is because there can be, there can actually be more than one subscriber for a given publisher of of uh, events. So, so basically, think of it as the uh, the subscriber is kind of opting into to something that's that's just there. Uh, the the publisher is publishing, and it's it's on the onus is on the subscribers to to get themselves plugged in. Um, and this is. Uh, this can sometimes be, be implemented in terms of, of like a, a queue data structure. Um, so let's actually think about a publisher in, in uh, as, as an analogy. Let's let's think of it as like an actual newspaper publisher, and then the uh, the subscribers in this in this model would be the actual people getting a newspaper thrown onto their lawn. You know, sure, you had to, you had to be the one to sign up to receive the newspaper, but those the newspapers are actually arriving at your house on the terms of the publisher. So you're not you're not asking for the newspaper every morning. You you ask to get newspapers, and and the publisher um, gets them there when when they decide to to get them to you. Um, and this is also this is also this also can be known as um, push-based messaging, since um, you know, the, su the subscriber 
doesn't specifically like like we said because the subscriber doesn't specifically ask for the data as it's coming for each discrete piece of data. So, and ex so and there's there's tons of um, examples of technologies that implement this pattern, um, WebSockets or or RabbitMQ or the, there's there's a ton. Um, and so then let's uh, let's look at messaging from the uh, from the other perspective. Um, what does messaging look like when we're interacting with a view? Um, this this can be referred to as uh, request response or uh, the query um, like a, a query pattern, a query messaging pattern. And this is where a requesting party is asking um, for data. And the responding party replies with that data. Um, and so these, the request and response have a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, uh, and you know, examples of this are HTTP. Everyone, everyone's probably pretty familiar with HTTP, but um, things like SQL or, or GraphQL um, also implement this. Uh, uh, and it's it can be it can be known as a as poll based messaging, since the receiver will only get um, data when they ask for it. <clears throat> so we've uh, we've been talking about messaging just in the general sense, um, but. And, and, and we've actually kind of come up with with a bit of a mental framework here for kind of kind of splitting these these two major patterns of use in, you know just by by, by by looking at them right but that's not exactly uh, why you're here um, we want to apply this to healthcare data <clears throat> you know I I suspect very few people watching this uh, talk are operating their own hospital. Uh, with their very own EHR software. So if our goal is to do something useful with healthcare data, we have to get it from somewhere else. Um, that may be a healthcare provider running EHR software. Um, obviously, you, that, that may be a healthcare provider proxying through, through Redox. Um, but at any rate, the the, the data is coming from from somewhere else so and and I I kind of hate to say it but the uh, the software that uh, health systems are running isn't exactly known for being on the cutting edge technologically speaking um, in some cases they, they could be running software that's that's older than me um, but that's but that's not even necessarily a bad thing um, you know, old software is uh, is battle tested software. <clears throat> um, but uh, but that does mean that that you can't really expect the way that these that this software behaves to change overnight, and you especially can't change you can't expect it to change on on our behalf. So whatever patterns of communication the healthcare systems might prefer to use, um, it's it's wise of us to understand them and adapt to them and and to also architect around them. Because uh, as of now they're not they're not exactly um, they're not exactly moving. So there are a lot of technologies we could talk about when it comes to consuming healthcare data from a health system. And, um, you know, those range in age and sophistication from actual literal fax machines to the latest and greatest web technologies of today. Um, but the, th the thing I wanna focus on from here on out um, as we kind of talk about fitting healthcare data into into the, these uh, this mental framework we we kind of built up is HL7 v2, and um, 
there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, the, the first is that it's incredibly ubiquitous in the industry. So even if you're not directly speech, speaking HL7 v2 over MLP, which, um, you know, if you're, you know, th thank goodness you're not, if you're not, um, uh, if you're, if you're consuming the, the Redox API, um, we were happy to, to kind of abstract away some of the, some of the real rough spots there. And that's great. Um, but whether, whether you're, you're speaking HL7 over MLP directly, um, or not, there's a very good chance that you're, you're kind of working downstream of something that is. And, and while the, the, the tricky bits of, of say, like data normalization or, um, or, or just the bizarre stuff related to networking protocols of, of HL7 over MLP, even if you're not having to deal with that, um, a lot of the other tricky bits can still kind of get, get uh, work their way downstream in, in how you have to, to deal with this data. So it's, it's still wise to, to kind of understand how this works and to understand how it, how it impacts us. Um, another reason is the, the challenges that I talked about there, um, I think are, are difficult. And so, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to dig into here. Um, but I think the, the most important thing here is, uh, is that I think, uh, is that I think the problems involved are, are actually interesting. Um, you know, being a, a hard problem doesn't necessarily make something an interesting problem. Uh, you know, setting up healthcare data integrations by exchanging flat files by SFTP is not an easy task. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make it an interesting one. And, and I think that HL7 v2 data presents an interesting set of challenges to solve because, you know, without a good mental model for how, how the patterns of messaging impact your architecture, I think the solution to these problems um, isn't exactly, I, I don't think the solutions are obvious. And in fact, I think you can, you can kind of get led into the wrong direction. So we're going to talk about the technical implications of being on the consuming side of data that has that has originated from from an HL7 v2 data source. Um, the first thing we're going to do is take a quick peek at what HL7 v2 actually looks like. Uh, if you don't have to deal with this particular format, um, thank goodness uh, I'm, I'm envious. Um, but this is a this is a example HL seventy two message. Um, it's it's a character delimited text format. Um, it's sent directly over a TCP socket um, using a, a protocol called uh, called MLP. And, uh, and that whole thing is then often tunneled via VPN. Um, this, this one in particular is a HL, uh, sorry, it's a ADT message. Um, I believe it's a, I believe it's a message that a patient has been admitted. Um, but there's all sorts of, of types within ADT, like, um, being discharged or transferred. Um, and then there are also types entirely different from ADT that cover things like scheduling or, or orders. Um, but uh, <clears throat> so based on what I've just talked about here, um, it almost seems like we, we actually have enough information to kind of categorize this protocol into one of the two types of of messaging patterns that, that we talked about before. Um, you know, if we're talking in terms of, of a health system sending to us, and we're talking about things like 
discharge or a, a transfer, they just kind of have this eventy sound to them, right? They're these these are these are verbs that that um, that that are describing things that happen. They, 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 it sounds like events. So let's let's assume that that we're building an application that wants to know at any given time where a patient is in the hospital. It then become it, it, it falls to us to to consume each and every one of these event messages and to update a view that we talked about earlier so that that view will reflect what's going on. Now, in this case, um, we're talking about consuming those that data into a, into a database of sorts, right? <clears throat> so at this point, you might be thinking, uh, I thought there was going to be something interesting about this protocol. Um, it kind of sounds like a cut and dry case of consuming events from a feed and then updating a view. Um, and not only that, but it, it kind of guided us there by itself, right? We didn't we didn't actually have to know these things about messaging beforehand. Um, we didn't need this mental framework to figure it out. Um, it just it, we we just want go go with the flow and and the right architecture kind of emerges, right? Um, I don't know if that I don't think that's necessarily true. Because um, there's some there's kind of some snags here that that make a really big difference. So, do you remember when I likened receiving pub sub messages to getting a newspaper delivered to you? Um, so here's a question: If you cancel your newspaper subscription for three months, and then you renew your subscription, uh, what's going to show up on your lawn tomorrow morning? Uh, are you going to get the next one newspaper from three months ago? Uh, are you going to receive all 90 of the newspapers you missed? Or are you going to receive uh, tomorrow's news? And, you know, hopefully you'll figure out what you missed from your friends. Uh, the answer is <clears throat> you're getting tomorrow's news. So... All that stuff you missed, you missed. It's it's gone. Um, hope you catch up. Uh, that might be acceptable for newspapers, um, but is this acceptable in the healthcare world? You know, if your application breaks from consuming events from a health system, is it, is it okay to just start up again later, like nothing happened? Um, you know, we talked about an application that might need to construct a view of where someone is in the hospital. So imagine if we received an event that a patient was admitted and then we just checked out for a little while and missed some events. And, and in that period, uh, we missed a, a discharge for that, for that patient. Uh, what, what does our view think is, happened? Well, our view now thinks that this poor patient must live at the hospital because they're never leaving. Um, so no, uh, it, that's that's not an acceptable outcome in healthcare. Um, we're not allowed to miss the news. So if we're going to receive this information as as a series of events. We're actually going to have to come up with a strategy for ensuring lossless, gapless, ordered delivery. Because um, anything anything short of that um, can lead us to to bizarre conclusions. Um, and you know, for for software that's that's uh, that people's health depends on, it can be downright dangerous. So. 
So what does the what does HL seven V two do to uh, combat this? So what HL seven V two does is called an ACK. Um, that's short for acknowledgement. Uh, and this is an event that the consuming party sends back to the publisher, telling them that they have safely received the previous message and that we can continue. Um, the publisher in this case then actually has to kind of maintain this, this notion of, uh, of like, of say like a queue of what has been sent and some sort of a cursor to so that so that it can keep track of what events it has sent and if the receiver stops acknowledging that no data is lost or placed out of order uh, <clears throat> and uh you know this this act is is, is what happens um to hl7 v2 data as consumed um over the MLP protocol, but but if you're if you're downstream of of a feed like this, um, the same thing is true for for the uh, for for say receiving HL7 over HTTP, right? Or or if you're if you're receiving um, a, a JSON data model that is um, derived from a feed. You have to you have to respond affirmatively that, that you received it, otherwise you won't get the next one. So, what we have here is not just a series of events pushed to us from a publisher, but actually a formal send and acknowledgement for each discrete piece of data. And so that kind of causes us to, to have to stop here and think, what does this actually look like? You know, is, is this actually just the request response pattern, but kind of kind of like flipped around? <clears throat> As if to say, like, the, the sending party here is, is making a request to our application to say, please take receipt of this data, and our application has to respond Okay, I've got it. Uh, it it kind of looks that way, and that's uh, that's kind of where our, our problem begins. Because um, without that that mental framework we built up about about um, you know what 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 these messaging patterns are, <clears throat> the actual implementation that we would that we would write to handle this kind of guides us into treating it as if it were just plain request response. And if we treat it that way, we, we run headfirst into an architectural nightmare. Um, we're we're going to have terrible throughput. Um, uh, because the, the protocol dictates that each request gets its own response. It's, uh, it's tempting for us as the implementers to look at it and say, of course, um, <clears throat> I, I write HTTP request handlers all the time. Um, I'll just do that again. Uh, sure, it, it might look a little different. Um, maybe if, if you are speaking directly uh, HL7 over MLP, uh, it definitely will look a little different on the edges. But you know, if you're if this is proxied over over HTTP, then then it it's just going to look like request response to you. Um, and so so you go to write the code for your handler. Um, so you receive the data from from the health system. And uh, you know, can you respond affirmatively at this point? Can you can you essentially do an act? Um, well, you haven't integrated it into your into your view or, or or into your database or anything like that. So, you know, what would happen if you if you act now, but your server crashed prior to it landing somewhere safe? Um, you're you're not getting this 
newspaper again. So, so we can't act, or at least not yet. Okay, so we, we have the data, and um, maybe your application needs to validate it that, it, that it meets some structural criteria. Um, and maybe you need to, to do some, some sort of mapping or, or transformation, transformation over it um, prior to it being integrated into your view. So maybe so you need to do that. And then maybe you need to, to supplement it with data from another view. So maybe you have a, a, a database that you need to, to reach out to to, uh, to to hydrate extra extra fields on this on this piece of data before you before you write the whole thing into your database. Well uh, let's first of all, let's hope that can't fail. Um, uh, but now we can we can finally write this thing to our to our database. We can we can uh, integrate it into our view. So we've run through all of our business logic between receiving an event from a health system and and doing this persistence, this integrating into our view. Um, let's let's act the the dank thing. Um, do, uh, do you see what the, the problem is here? Uh, how, how on earth is this going to scale? Uh, this solution really, really can't scale all that well. Um, because we've, we've written this in a way that is familiar to us, um, because it, it pushed us towards writing this as, as a request response sort of handler. Um, but then, but think about how you usually scale out request response. Um, you, know, you might, you might have read those all those blog posts or articles on the internet about some company talking about how how they did this or that to scale to handling billions of requests per second. Um, well, you can't do what they did uh, because. The, the normal way to, to, to scale um, in a request res response model is to, to make is to, to make yourself able to handle handle multiple requests concurrently. And you know what, what we have to remember is that the events we're receiving have to be received strictly in order. So regardless of our technical ability to handle another concurrent request, we're not going to get one, at least not until you respond to the previous one. So what that means is that the maximum throughput you're going to be able to achieve in consuming data from, from this health system is going to come down to how quickly we can execute this one handler um, serially. So at a certain volume, this becomes uh, impossible. Um, you're going to be you're going to be causing backups on on the the sending side, and you know basically just nothing but trouble is going to come out of this. So given that we that we built up this that that mental model about how to identify um, messaging patterns kind of in the first half of the talk, we were able from the start to kind of look at the semantics of the HL7v2 data. And we kind of got this gut feeling that we were dealing with a publish subscribe type of pattern. Um, but then the fact that it was brokered to us over a request response protocol um, kind of threw us for a loop. Uh, but the fact the fact that it's that it's brokered to us in that way um, might be less relevant than than we think. So, although we have to to write our handling code in a in a way that um, that treats this as kind of a request response pattern, why don't we 
why don't we do as much as we can to try and treat the data that it that it's asking to be treated? Um, these want these are events. Um, they want to be events. So let's try and make them events. So let's take the handler we had before. But now let's throw out as much of the business logic as possible that stands between our receipt and acknowledgement. And instead, let's try as hard as possible to turn this into an event that that is internal to our own architecture. So our goal is now no longer to integrate this patient being admitted event into our into our view, um, but but actually to 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 pass this along or to, to get this into an event form in our own architecture uh, as quickly as possible. And what that allows us to do is set up other separate um, pieces of, uh, of code, other services that, that can consume uh, from this internal event feed and perform the necessary task. But it's performing them in a way that doesn't block us from being able to respond affirmatively to the, uh, to, to the upstream system. So the new event we're talking about here, we can, we can publish using any number of uh, durable um, pub sub technologies. Um, you can use Kafka or, or Kinesis or RabbitMQ. Um, you, can, you can build something entirely in-house if you want. But um, the important part is that it allows you to decouple our ability here to respond with the acknowledgment from our ability to run this message through our business logic. And that's a huge win for us because it allows us to keep the ingest throughput of HL7v2 to remain blazing fast, um, kind of regardless of, of the implementation of our business logic. And you know, we were able to do this because we recognized the messaging patterns that were kind of hiding there the whole time. Um, so I want to I wanna wrap all of this up by kind of taking a step back. And um, let's think about all the things that, that allowed us to recognize and implement this optimization. So first of all, we had to have some kind of internal mental model for the, the general patterns of, me of messaging. You know, we needed the ability to look at something and say, "This, this looks like pub sub." You know, these are these are events that I'm receiving. I should treat them as such. Or, or you know, we need to develop the skill to to look at something and say, "This looks like uh, a request response, or a, or like a query mob, a, a, um, a query um, pattern." And 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 to know the difference. Um, the, the second thing is that uh, just recognizing those differences isn't enough. You know, we need to understand the implications that, that these patterns have on our application architectures. And then finally, when we actually have to go out there and interface with systems, you know, specifically in the healthcare industry, that, that we can't control the design of, you know, we have to be prepared to take the ways that those systems implement messaging, and we need to wholly adapt to them. All right. So, thank you so much for watching, and I'll uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have now. Nice, Turner or Tanner. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have any uh, questions? That was uh, that was super comprehensive, and I, I really appreciated you uh, explaining the basics and the metaphors in there. Um, and I thought the patterns were were very um, 
well described. Well, I know that people want a copy of this. Um, it will be posted on YouTube. That's the easiest way to get it. You can subscribe to our channel. Uh, it's linked in the chat. Um, and we're going to continue to talk about patterns. You know, this is a this is a perennial topic, and we know that that developing as an industry, uh, developers developing a um, productive vocabulary around how to deal with messaging is the best way that we can communicate with each other and think about what we're doing. And I think Tanner really laid the groundwork there to um, to start that productive conversation. So oh, I, we do have a question. Excellent. So uh, Luke asks, have you worked with any reactive streams implementations? Um, reactive streams are, are something I've uh, I've worked with. Um, I haven't implemented them in in kind of a the context that, that we're talking about here. Um, one thing that that I've found, and and maybe I just I wasn't digging in far enough, was that um, while you could kind of use them for for laying out control flows, you couldn't. I, I couldn't find ways to kind of make sure that things that 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 there was no overlap between the events as they were kind of passing through through uh, a reactive stream. And so in a system where you you actually have to you have to complete processing of, of, a, of a message, say, um, kind of discreetly ordered, um, it, it, it kind of it, it didn't really fit the use case is, is what I found. Oh, it's interesting. I, I have enough experience with React to be dangerous, and that does make sense based on your um, definition of how this needs to work. So uh, we got a good new question also from Pavel. Um, he says, what is the best strategy for resource matching in healthcare? Um, example, uh, we're getting messages with patients, appointments, observations, and need to create or update them in our own database. What fields can be used to identify that resource? I know that it may be complicated, but anyway, is it enough just enough to use source ID, um, meaning hospital ID, plus the patient MRN, just from your experience? You know, un unfortunately, there isn't really a, a one size fits all answer to that, because um, a lot of it comes down to the way that the the originating health uh, health care organization. Um, Kind of deals with that. Um, you may you may find that 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 is enough to kind of uniquely identify a patient in most cases, but you can always find a HCO that you're trying to integrate with where that just simply isn't true. So there's really there's really no blanket um, answer to that. Yeah, and um, my understanding is that we do have a roadmap. Uh, we have a roadmap patient ID uh, feature that, that would help with that problem, right? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, uh, Redox is it's, itself um, implement, uh, working on implementing a, a, patient, a unique patient identifier um, solution. Cool. All right, BJ's got a question. Um, what is the impact on throughput if errors occur in non-validation portion of the logic? So there's there's a a couple couple things you need to kind of uh, think about there. Um, one would be uh, what do you consider a, a fatal error, and what do you consider um, what like a like schematic error? Um, so like if if your database is down, um, then Obviously, you can't you can't do anything. Um, you have to. You you can still consume from from your upstream systems, but you have to you have to buffer until until it, your system becomes healthy again. Now, if you're talking if we're talking about um, errors in the form of like poorly formed data or 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 something of, of that sort. Um, a useful pattern there would be would be uh, what's what's known as a dead letter queue, where where basically 
you know, you you have this this stream at this point, and um, you know, you need you need to park it off somewhere else, and uh, and basically continue on with with your processing. Um, and so you can you can create um, handlers for for remediating stuff out of the dead letter queue, um, or depending on on your volume, um, you know that might be that might be we're talking like manual intervention at that point. Um, but basically, you need to you need to take it out of the the mainstream of data and and let everything continue to flow. <laughs> 